All right. Uh, for some of you have request have questions regarding how to embed a video into your web page. I know a lot of you have done that in the past. Um, so if you attended my other classes uh, in the past, probably I ask you to directly uh, save your video file, MP4 file, into your space on the server and put a link in there. I found out that's not a, the best way to do it because it's taking a lot of space on the server. That's the first thing. Another thing is um, that app, that player is not really versatile. You, know, it's, you couldn't speed up the video because sometimes when, when I'm talking, I'm not really concise. If you feel playing the video, you probably want to play like 10 times faster, you know, two times faster or so. Um, I think the YouTube uh, video player is, is way better than, than the one I have on my website. Hey. What's up? DVD drive. Here. Here. Um, okay, so if I create a new file, I call it test dot HTML. And I use Composer to open this file. Okay, so that's the web page. Test, test, save. And now let's find a video online. Okay, whatever. Let's go to YouTube. My channel probably. Scrap a video and go to share and embed. Just copy and paste. Okay, just copy everything here and go back to your HTML file and go to source. Uh, paste the code. In, in in the middle of body body you see body here let me zoom in so you can see what's going on there no they couldn't zoom in the code never mind can you see that so body body so have has to be in between these two okay so br means branch um it's actually just enter into a new line okay i just copy and paste everything from the youtube to here and i will save it uh, you couldn't see it here because uh, Composer is, is a free software. It doesn't have a player inside. It's not able to play that for you. So you need a, you need a browser. Hmm? Okay. Uh -huh. Got you. Great. That, that's, yeah. So let's see. So, so this, this, this is the way you can do it, okay? So there's another way Nick just recommended. Let's take a look. Where? Insert. HTML? Oh, here. Okay. Great. Either way. Refresh. So we got two videos. <laughs> All right, clear? Okay. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I shouldn't delete it that fast. Anyway, okay. Um so let's take a look at the interrupt thing. <clears throat> You may have noticed that we changed the deadline for which one? For homework uh, four, I think, I guess, to next Monday. And we're going to have a quiz on Monday as well, next week. Uh, I will give you an example, probably later today or tomorrow. So you can just uh, study that package 
for the quiz uh, for quiz one. Uh, so tomorrow, no, Wednesday. Have you done your PCB yet? You? I, I know you are. You have completed that. Okay. Uh, not tomorrow, but today uh, until 3 p.m. and Wednesday. If you if you if you need to work on the uh, homework four, you just work on homework four on Wednesday. If you are uh, if you need to solder a PCB, just go to the lab, go to the PCB. But we won't we don't we won't have any new lectures. So it gives the time to you guys to work on either complete homework four or solder a PCB. Work on the report. Okay. Yeah, it will be in the lab. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be eleven fifteen to three p.m. on Wednesday. It's in the email. Just check the email. I sent it to you yesterday. So the lab will be open until three p.m. today as well. Huh? From from uh, eleven fifteen. Already started. So there's a task, I think it's like two point something, two point four something in this tutorial. There's nothing new, okay? It's the same same tutorial I showed you uh, two weeks ago. But there's one thing you you probably haven't learned that before. Um, so interrupt can be a little bit confusing. There there are three timers. Or you can say three interrupt resource resources in the 328p microcontroller. Where can you find that? Go to the data sheet of the microcontroller. I think I provided a link like this one, for example. Let's click that. I believe you were in either my logic class or digital electronics class in the past. Um, just to, to remember how to build a counter. Now you have uh, the flip flops. Uh, I think it's a T flip flop. Right? So whenever a signal comes in, it's going to toggle the output. And you have that output as the clock signal for the next stage. So if you have three of these uh, T flip flops, you're going to have a three bit counter, something like that. Um, because we know every single clock of the uh, 328p microcontroller takes one over 16 mega seconds. The reason is a uh, little crystal oscillator is 16 megahertz clock resource, right? So we know the clock has uh, 16 mega up and downs in one second, right? So in that case, we actually know every period of that clock is going to be one over 16 mega seconds, right? So given that, if you have a counter, if you count for 10 times, this is going to take 10 times one over 16 mega seconds. Is that confusing or did you get it? Probably not. That's a clock. It's given, right? So you have 16 mega periods per second. Or you can say it's 16 megahertz. It's the same concept. So know every single period here takes 1 over 16 mega seconds. Is that correct? Okay, so now you have a time scale already. And if you have 10 periods, so it's going to be 10 times 1 over 16 mega seconds. And you know exactly how long it takes for 10 periods. All right, that's why your 
a digital system, you can make a digital clock, digital watch like this. Because you know the crystal, the resource, uh, you know, the clock resource is how much, you know, megahertz per sec, uh, megahertz or how many cycles per second. Yeah. Um, so in that case, if you build a counter, for example, like we are designing a digital watch, right? I'm, I'm, I have, I can design a counter easily uh, as a digital block in the digital circuits. And the digital counter has an input, which is this guy, for example, or this clock resource. Okay. And I will not trigger the output until 16 mega times of the counter. So every 16 mega times, I'm going to trigger the output for once. So I can have a very accurate one second clock output from the, from the counter. I can use that one second, uh, you know, or one hertz clock as a clock resource for my digital watch, you know, something like this. Um, but for interrupt, we are using the counter for different purpose. Um, because you want to have a one mic controller to run uh, different tasks. Whenever the mic controller is, is running one as a permanent loop, the loop function, void loop function, uh, permanently, it's going to keep running back and forth inside the loop function. But whenever there's uh, anything happens, you want to trigger the interrupt, just stop everything in the loop function and run that sub function. It's called ISR, which is interrupt. Um, service routine. So it's a function. It's written in this way, ISR, and there's a vector inside. So the vector is like a flag. Whenever the interrupt is being triggered, the flag will be uh, set to one or something. So it, there will be a signal to set that uh, specific variable. And you can have a little function here, whatever you want to do. Okay. So th this function is independent to the loop function. So it's not being um, revoked or something. So it's just being triggered by the interrupt signal, but nothing else. So it's running pretty independently in, inside of my controller. So that's the biggest benefit by using this one. Um, do you have any examples in your mind about any applications using interrupts in real life? Let's take a look at the code first. Uh, a normal function, you can call it uh, using how do I Let me redo it? So a regular function is being um, being called by something else. So that's the ISR. Okay, just one. Just you, you, when you are typing this one in your IDE, it's pretty similar. Like you are typing a different function in there. Like, but actually, is it, you don't need to call it right using another line in your loop function or anywhere else. It's going to be triggered whenever the timer is up. Okay, so it's called. You know, you just type ISR blah blah blah, and put whatever you want to execute. Uh, in inside this curly bracket, so that's the uh, uh, interrupt the service routine, and that's a timer one's flag. So whenever timer one is up, 
this one will be triggered and whatever inside here will be executed. So the difference between this one and the regular function is you don't need to call this function uh, in your loop function, like whatever I'm doing here. Um, so this is a function, right? So no interrupts and interrupts, they are functions. Uh, but they are not showing in your sketch. It's running behind the scene. It's in the library. Okay. Uh, but this one, this function, this may be confusing you. So this function is not the function calling the ISR function. You know what I mean? So if you look at the code, so this is whatever you want to put in the setup uh, function be, will be executed for once whenever you uh, part it up. All right. So this will set up your interrupt service in the Mac controller. You know, because if you don't set up everything, the Mac controller won't do the interrupt function for you. You have never used that before, right? Because you didn't set it up. So you have to set up everything. I'm going to explain to you what are they to configure every parameter in there. There are so many different types of interrupts. You can set up a, um, so like using this number to set up how long you wanna enter, you wanna, uh, you wanna trigger that interrupt. So whatever I'm doing here is four seconds. So every four seconds, it's gonna trigger that interrupt function and run whatever in the, in the ISR, all right? So the way to calculate it is all here. So I have to configure the specific registers to make it happen. It's something like when you are operating a machine, right? You want that machine to be operated in that way. You have to change all the parameters. You have to, like a power supply, you have to change it to five volts, like three amps, something like that. You have to configure it. But here, the way to configure the Mac controller is, um, setting up the registers inside. Just give a specific value to it. Um, and the place to find out all these values definitely are in this um, data sheet for that Mac controller. So that's... Uh, table of contents here. And scroll down, you can see TC0, TC1, TC2. So there are three digital blocks for the counter and uh, timer and counter uh, purpose. So TC means timer counter zero. So zero is just a number for that block. TC0, TC1, TC2. So there are three different types of timer and counters inside. There's are just different uh, different digital circuits in there, but they are they are all timers and counters in the Mac controller. It's a digital block. Okay. And this is a pretty important concept. I mean if you have been programming with Mac controllers for a while but have never used interrupts, you are always in the entry level. Whenever you start using interrupts it's just, you know, not entry level anymore. Right? A little bit more proficient with my controllers. So this is important. Just definitely uh, understand how to use it. Okay. Um, there are three times on counters. TC0, TC1, TC2. And you can see that TC0 is 8-bit. TC1 is 16-bit. TC2 is 8-bit. So they just have a different lens for all the memory banks inside. Uh, also the registers as well. So the registers, they are simply just uh, um, latches. You, you were in logic, right? You know what are latches? I saw latches, or the latches. So they are just latches with, uh, you, know, you have one, two, three, you have eight. It's gonna be an eight bit memory with all the latches. And 16 bit, you need 16 latches to make that memory bank. Um, Sometimes, depends on the, the, the application, you probably need a 16-bit instead of 8-bit because 16-bit will give you a larger number 
can be stored in the register. But 8-bit doesn't have that many options to configure that memory. I think we what we used here is, let's take a look. So if you see TCCR1, so you know it's, uh, it's using the timer counter 1, not 2, not 0. So this is timer counter 1. So you are using a 16-bit timer counter, so which is this guy. So TCCR1, so TC, T means timer, counter, controller, register, I think. So timer, counter, control, register. Timer 1, A. So that's the register A for this purpose. All right, so that's just one register. So let's take a look. What is that register? TCCR1A. Let's search for that. Okay, start getting all these registers. TC1 control register. That's a TC1 control register. And the name of that register you want to put in the code is TCCR1A. Right? So that register has 8 bits. I know this is a 16-bit counter, but the registers are only 8 bits. Um, so we'll explain why why you need 16 bits later. So just take a look at this register. That's TCCR1A has 8 bits, right? So bit 2 and bit 3 are not being used. Nothing there, no function. Uh, but you can see WGM10, WGM11 uh, are the two bits you have to configure uh, to set up your interrupt. So let's take a look, what are they? So we are not doing anything here, I guess. Just uh, use a default value. So it's going to be 0, 0. Normal port operation, whatever. Okay. You don't have to set up every single bit in the register. It's going to be confusing. Like, if you don't set up, if you don't assign any values to here, they are going to use the default value, which are zeros. See, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 as well. But we probably need these two bits to be a different value. Let's take a look. What are these two bits? Um, WGM10, WGM11, right? Take a look. WGM10, WGM11. Bit 0 and bit 1. They are here in this table. WGM10, WGM11. And I think if you if we, if we go back to the to here, we didn't set up WGM10, WGM11. Actually, we only set up we only set WGM12 to be one. And so this line, this line is pretty interesting. We don't have too many. Uh, don't, don't, don't be scared. Okay. Uh, if you see all these set up. Uh, Lines, you know, it's, it's just shift, uh, shift, uh, left shift this value uh, to the left by one, no, uh, left shift one by this value, right? So let, let me show you, let me write it down so you can understand it. So <clears throat> it's not really uh, intuitive here in all these uh, Atmel's smart controllers. That's the way they designed it. But the, the whatever it is trying to do is super simple. It's very simple. It's explained to a five-year-old uh, kid. They can probably understand this as well. It's super simple. So let me let's don't look at this for now. Right. <clears throat> so you have a a bit memory here. So let's say, let's call it TCCR1A, 8 bits, okay? 
So for example, let it's, it's, it's not, I'm just assuming there's one bit here as zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So here is a, a bit four. I want to set this bit, specific bit to one. Because this bit is controlling a function in the time in the interrupt. If I set up to one, it's gonna enable something. All right, it's like a remote controller. Just press that push button, you turn on that function. And that register, that's a control register, timer counter control register. Right? So this register has eight bits you can set or reset in order to enable or disable any functions. All right. So for example, I'm trying to set this bit to one to open or enable any functions in my controller. This is not exactly whatever uh, we are using. I'm just assuming to make you understand this. If we are programming this function, this type of thing in a different microcontroller like PIC. So for microchip, Inc, right? That's a different company. And it's been popular for like 40, 50 years until Arduino's microcontroller became popular about 20 years ago. Nobody used Artemel's microcontrollers because it's just not, not the best. But now a lot of programmers, you know, they develop all so many libraries, make it super easy to use. Whenever you want to develop a project, it just takes way shorter time when compared to all the other, you know, very old, obsolete um, microcontrollers. But all the engineers like me, you know, came from 50 years ago. <laughs> we have been programming or configuring registers for a long time, and it's really intuitive and easy to do. Okay, so what you do actually, if you are programming in here, use a different Mac controller, you want to set up this guy, you just do this tccr1a dot. One, I forgot the, is that P1 or D1, I forgot, but there's just, you just do a dot something and you assign one to it. It's going to directly set this bit, maybe four, or can be a different four format. But you just need to write down or type the register's name and dot that bit, or sometimes it's bit four, right? Just write it bit four. And one assigned to these registers before. That's it. Done. You you will enable the, you will set this pin as uh, this bit in the register and enable a specific function. But now in Atmel, in the 328p microcontroller, it's different. It just trying to confuse you. It's just doing the same job. Let's take a look. All right. So it's doing this. TCCR1B or assign one shift WGM12. So let's find out WGM12 first. TCCR1B. It's not even TCCR1A. So let's take a look. What, what is that one? TCCR1B. It's a different, it's a different register. Okay? Different register. And let's see, WGM12 is here, WGM12. And that's a register, that's a specific bit in the register. And it's trying to use a line like this to set WGM12, that specific bit to one. How that works? Why this line can do that job? That's the only main thing you want to learn today. You can see all the rest of them are the same, doing the same thing. That's, that's pretty simple. So this line is setting this bit to be one. That's it. That's everything this is doing here. The way it does that is one is one, right? If you if you have a one number one in your 328p microcontroller, it's going to be an eight bit one. Let's write it down. So in your 8-bit microcontroller, if you 
have an integer one, you know it's going to be this, right? In the memory, in the computer system, right? So that, that's for integer one in your uh, controller. Uh, I know int in, in uh, 328p is 16 bit. So probably you have, it's going to assign another memory bank to it. So it's actually taking uh, 16 bits as an int one. Right, so it's like eight zeros, another seven zeros, and one. Yeah, but normally you don't need to worry about that. You just think about this is a bit computer system, and this is one. And if you look at this line we used in the in the code, it's doing TCC R one B, which is an a bit register, has all the a bits in there. You don't know what are they. And you don't need to touch all the rest of the other bits. For example, TCCR1B has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 bits. WGM, if you write down WGM12 in your IDE, that so this represents the position or location of that bit. So if you take a look at here, WGM12, is 3. So WGM12 in the code, so this guy here is actually 3. So in that case, What does this one do? So one. So that's one, right? So one is being left shifted by three bits. So you are getting So where's the one? One, two, three. So after this, so this is this. Is that clear? And then you or TCCR1B, which is this guy, you don't know what are they. By default, they should be zeros. All zeros. So this or equal sign means this equals to this or this right remember that so this or equals just it's just a easier way to to do that right it's the same as so this is the same as tccr1b equals to not equals to but you assign whatever on the right to the left TCCR1B or one left shift WGM12. If you do this, it's going to do a, it, it will do the same job for you in the code. Same result, no problem. This and this, either way. Okay? So this or this is actually this or this. So it's going to set, it's going to set this bit. To be one. So eventually you are getting TCCR1B. Have a one here. And that's it. A quick question why you need a one here, but nothing else? Why not two? Why not three? I know, but if you write a two, it's going to convert into binary as well. Why I'm left shift? Uh, I'm, I'm left shifting one here.
why I need a one? So if you look at the, the other examples, they're always one. Even though they're in different registers and the different bits, but I always use one. Why? Yeah, it's just because the, the purpose of this one is to cite a specific, a specific bit in the register, right? Is that clear? Well, I've been talking about this for, for, for a long time, right? So the purpose here is to cite one specific bit in the register so I can turn on that function to enable it. So I can, if I keep doing this, I can actually configure every single bit in the register. So the reason you need a one is because you have a seven zero in the front and one as ISB, so you can directly left shift that one to, to that location and or it. So if you or it, you will set that location in the register to be one. Right, so always need a one to be uh, to start with. And how many steps you want to left shift it just depends on the which register. So that so that specific bit in the register represent is actually the, the location, the number. Uh, it's a number, it's not a not a not a string at all. So this is a number. So WGM12, go back to the Data sheet, you can see it's three. So simply just uh, one being left shifted by three bits, and then or the original TCC R1B register. So you can set this bit to be one. All right. So in peak, my controller, you don't need to do this, right? You just do this. You see R1B. I'm not sure we can do this as well in here. If you want to try, try it. I'm, but I think probably not. Otherwise, we will re recommend you to do that. It's, this is the same same function in Pix, not here. In Pix, my controllers for microchip ink. I think this is more intuitive, right? Just so everything it's doing is just that site this this bit to be one. That's it. Nothing else. And keep in mind, another thing you need, you need a one to be here is because you want to keep all the other bits to be what? Zeros. So when you are doing an OR operation, the zeros won't affect any other bits in the register. Only one will kill it and put a one here. But all the other ones, when, when it's doing an OR operation with zero, not being changed. All right. So now let's take a look. What are what are these bits? WGM12. Let's take a look. What's this one doing? WGM12. You know, so there are three WGMs, like WGM13, 121110. And I did not set any other WGMs except WGM12. So what's a binary combination for these four bits eventually? I didn't touch the other bits. I just set WGM12. So what's the binary value for the, for the four bits? That's a table, right? So it depends on the binary numbers for the four bits. You just look at What's the function is being triggered, being enabled, which is here, timer counter mode of operation. So you can look at, you can set up different values for these four bits and give a different mode of operation for the interrupt. Okay, and we are using CTC mode right now. And I only set WGM12 to be one, but I didn't touch the other three bits, so they are still zeros. So actually I'm, I'm triggering or I'm enabling the CDC mode. So the CDC mode is, is going to count 
onto a specific number being stored in here, this variable, then immediately trigger the interrupt. Like I said, do you know the original clock resource of the map controller? You know, it's 60 megahertz. Okay? If you do not use any prescaler or divide the original frequency, and you know you are going to get 16 mega periods per second from that clock. And if you set up a maximum number here as a maximum count for that clock, you will know how long it takes to trigger one interrupt. Is that correct? Let's write it down on the paper so it's more intuitive. What is this? What is this? Huh? Yeah, but one over 60 miles, what is this? The period of the clock. So the unit here is second. So since I'm running on the CTC mode, so it's going to count until a number being stored in that variable. Which variable? OCR1A. I can assign a variable to it. And OCR1A is a 16-bit variable. So the maximum number can be stored in there will be Hmm. So the maximum number for OCR1A will be 2 to the 16th, right? So I don't know what's the number 2 to the 16th, I think, let, let, let me think about it. So 2 to the 10th will be 1024, 2 to the 6th will be Is that 64? So it's 64 times 1024. Okay. But we don't have to use that large number over here. So for example, I'm setting up. Yeah, let's just use this number, for example. And then so it's gonna count until this many counts. Then trigger the interrupt. So how long it is it is 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 this? So it's gonna be um 1024 times 64 over 16 mega. Four oh nine six times 10 to the negative six seconds, something like that. So every this much time going to trigger the interrupt for once. It's going to run whatever you put in the ISR function. And you don't need to call it. You don't need to put in any other lines in the code to call the ISR. It's going to be triggered automatically every this much time. Okay? Yes. Yeah, so if you have a different number here, you're changing this number, right? It just assign a different value to OCR1A. But this is still pretty pretty fast. You can tell it's less than so this is one, two, three. This is 0 0.4 milliseconds. Right? <laughs> but sometimes on the trigger, the ISR every a few seconds but not this fast. How can I do that? I don't want to directly use the original clock. I can pre-skill it. Pre-skill. Mm. I can pre-skill this clock. I can make this slower. So slow it down. 
So here is a function to do that. That's what this one doing here. CS12. So this bit is also in this TCC R1B register. Let's take a look. CS12. This one? So I have three bits in there. CS12, CS11, CS10. Three bits. So I have more options. And I only set up or I only set CS12 to be one, but not nothing else. Did you see CS11, CS10? You actually see this. So it's a different setup. <laughs> so I set CS12 and CS10 to be one inside this TCC R1B register. Is that correct? Do you agree with that? CS12, CS10, they are being set to one in this register. Take a look. CS12 is one, CS10 is one. So CS11 will be, hmm? What is CS11? Zero? Why? You didn't touch it. Did you? No. So the combination for these three bits will be 101. Oh, Let's take a look at the table. Where is 101? 101. What's this doing? Divide the original clock by 1,024 times. Slow it down. All right, that's a prescaler. And the last one, OCIE1A being set to one. So this is a different register, it's a TMSK1, let's take a look. TMSK1. So there are so many other registers, if you don't need to use it, do not touch it. It's not super complicated. If you don't, don't need to use it, just do, don't touch it at all. Let's find out the TAM SK1. Where is that one? Here. And OCIE1A. Beat. OCIE1A. OCIEA. Yeah, just put a one there. I mean, I don't know. Just put a one there. So OCIEA here is being set. It's a uh, set. It's just trying to set up a uh, different mode as well. So this is output compare a match interrupt enable. So what this one is doing is it's um, the outcome, the output is going to compare with the number, and if that matches, it's going to interrupt, enable interrupt. So where is the number assigned to the variable? It's here. That's a number being, being assigned to this one as the output compare register, OCR, output compare register. All right, so you assign a number to there, you enable that mode, and it's going to trigger the interrupt whenever it matches with this number. Whenever it reaches this number, it's going to trigger the interrupt. So let's do a calculation and see. Um, so here's a, here's a function to calculate that. How long, right? How long it's going to be triggered every time. Okay, so that's a signal to trigger the interrupts. So this signal 
finally becomes a, it's also a digital signal, you know that. It's a digital system. So this signal's frequency, is, is this a square wave? And the interrupt will be triggered on both rising edge and falling edge. It's already designed in the digital system. So just be aware of that. So every period for this frequency, for this signal, every period, the interrupt will be triggered for how many times? Twice. Because every single period has one rising edge and one falling edge. Right? So let's calculate this. This is 16 mega. Two is a constant. N is a prescator, which is 1024, we just set up. The OCR, uh, the CS11, CS12, CS11, CS10, these three bits. And times one plus this number, I think I assigned 62500 in there in the sketch. To calculate it, see what, what is this? Um, let's do it. Calculator. Hmm. Frozen. Wrong with my laptop. All right, so it's going to be sixteen times ten twenty four divided by two divided by six two five zero oh one. So this much hurts. Because that's a frequency, right? So this is this much hurts. Alright, so one over F O C N A equals to one over zero point one three. That's a T, right? So that's a period of this signal. It's somewhere cl close to eight seconds. Okay? So the period is eight seconds. So how long it takes to trigger the interrupt every time. So the trigger signal, the period of that triggering signal is eight seconds. How long it takes to trigger every single interrupt. So this is eight seconds. How long it takes to trigger the interrupt function every time? I'll just tell you four seconds. All right, it's well, running out of time. <laughs> four seconds, right? Because it's been triggered by twice every period. So four seconds. So by giving a number here to OCR1A, this number to that variable, you will be able to, so the map controller will be able to run ISR every four seconds. So something like this, so the loop function is running really quickly, right? Like, you know, little ISR here, right? ISR is doing something else. After four seconds, boom, run this. And after this is done, go back, keep running. After four seconds, run this, and then come back. So the benefit of that is it's going to store, so whatever, after it interrupts being triggered, Whatever is being running here can, will be sent to the memory. You are not losing anything. Same to the ISR. Okay? So the project is asking you to run the ISSD, S, SSD display module uh, to display the temperature. So when you are displaying the temperature, it need to, you need to display that in the main loop so you can have a smooth display. You are not seeing any blinking digits. So you need to run display in the loop. and Every four seconds, tag the temperature with a sensor. So you need to put your temperature sensing code in ISR, and you really don't need to 
you know, detect the, the temperature that often, right? I mean, four seconds is pretty long, actually. Uh, it's pretty short. You can, you can, I mean, 10 seconds is fine too, I think. The temperature is not changing that quickly. Um, so that's why you want to use interrupt in, in, in here. So you can do a multitask. If you do not do ISR, what's going to happen for the SSD? You can imagine you have to put your temperature sensor code in, inside the loop. So when you are scanning all the ISD modules, the time delay between the two, between every enabling every single digit will not be even. So it's going to blink. But if you are scanning here and you do this. It's going to store the original data. It's still displaying the old temperature data, but it's going to be updated afterwards. If they blink, they will blink at the same time, but not like like 2019, right? We've got two, the two will blink, right? But all the others will be steady number, which is, looks really bad. Is that making sense? Okay. All right. That's it for today.